Dr. Heba Shrita is from Saudi Arabia and achieved a, a Bachelor in Dental Surgery with honors from King Saud University in 1992. Worked for the Ministry of Health and Armed Forces Hospital before going to England where she achieved a Master of Science from the University of London, uh, UK in 1995. In 1996, she got her FDS, FRCSI Fellowship in general, in general Dental Surgery from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. She's worked as an associate consultant at King Fahad National Guard Hospital until 2000 when she moved to Dubai, UAE and established Dr. Hiba Shatha Specialized Dental Clinic, which is uh, um, a very, very popular clinic in this part of the world. Since 2002, Dr. Hiba has worked with Emirate Medical Association as a chairperson of the scientific committee for the Dental Society. In 2008, co-founded Child Early Intervention Medical Center an autism specialty center that provides unique services to children with autism under one roof. In 2010, Dr. Shatha co-founded the Child Learning and Enrichment Medical Center, a preparatory center with a unique model that gives every child individual education plan and teaches academics and manage the behaviors in the same time. So an integrated kind of a service for children with autism both centers are dedicated to inclusion of children with developmental delays in mainstream education. So that was definitely one of the trailblazer in terms of incremental change within this community. And as an outcome of these fantastic achievements, Dr. Hiba was awarded the Emirates Women Award in 2011 in the leadership category for her contribution to the society and to the community. So uh, when, when we read your, your profile, it 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 looks like that of someone who just doesn't stop. Now, before we move into the career and how you build, uh, you know, your entrepreneurial uh, venture, uh, uh, I'm sure our audience would like to know as to what extent has your early years in Saudi Arabia shaped who you are as a leader, as a businesswoman, as an entrepreneur, as a person, as a woman? Arabia, I, I was born in Lebanon. My parents used to live in Lebanon. And then I moved to Saudi when I was one year old. And the life in the 70s in Saudi Arabia is not like what is it today. It was really limited. We just went to school and came back home. So there isn't really much of cinemas or, or going out. I remember the first time I went to the zoo, I was 16 <laughs> because we don't have, you know, we didn't have that luxury. Um, but also it taught us how to be creative, play with friends and come up. We used to make our own books, our own games. And, and we used to have fun. I mean, it's not like... I see my kids today, they have all the toys and all the time they're saying they were bored. And we're not, we were not bored. We were able to entertain ourselves. Um, I start, I, I believe my parents, uh, I was like six years old and they took me to England and left me with a family in London to learn English. And when I was 11, I went to a boarding school in Switzerland again to learn French. So I, I started to become more independent at a very young age. Um, when I grew up, we used to go off on summer holidays, so I learned Spanish, I learned horse riding, taekwondo, and I'm lucky because I believe my father saw as a girl and a boy, there is no difference. So he gave me the same opportunity my, my brothers had. So we used to go together to play taekwondo. So this is something that um, I took, um, I think now today, if I would like to give a message to any mother, is don't be scared, let the children explore and be independent and um, there is nothing wrong with them to try and fail because at the end of the day, it shaped them to what they um, become in the future. Um, uh, something to take away, maybe when I um, grew up to finish my high school, I wanted to become a nuclear engineer, believe it or not. But of course, it wasn't an option. <laughs> when you, um, I finished high school, I had a very high marks from, from the tent top of the kingdom. You have a choice to become either a teacher or a doctor, so there isn't really much um, to become. Um, and I didn't like teaching, so I wanted to become a doctor, but I didn't like, you know, the on-call and the duties of a doctor. And, you know, you have to study so much. So I've chosen dentistry because then you don't have to, to be, you know, like a full time dedicated to the hospital. When I studied dentistry about the fourth year, I discovered that I have fell in love with surgery. I loved surgery, which is really medicine. So when I graduated and I joined the first job, which was the Ministry of Health, I asked to join the oral surgery department. And I remember I went to the chairman 
of the department and he said, what? You want to do surgery? I mean, this is a tough job for tough men. No, 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 you cannot do that. Going around, it's a really busy place. And there are skills for a young practitioner to learn from there. I learned how to think fast, how to work with the team, even if you don't know who they are. You have to make decisions, be responsible and accountable. You're working with lives here. People are bleeding. You have to stop. You have to think, x-rays, make um, decisions. A girl can do. So you've got a socialization experience where you've got a lot of opportunities to take risks and a lot of, you know, uh, opportunities to be in ambiguous spaces where you have to continuously start developing your own skills. Um, when I graduated with honor degree, my name is on the honor board, as a dentist, you think you know it all. You're, you have a big head. No, you earned it. So my friend came and she said, well, why don't we do the fellowship exam? I said, okay. So we went, what do I do? She said, you study physiology, pathology, histology. And we go and we set the exam. Of course, I sat for the exam and I failed. No way you can pass. <laughs> if, if you know about the fellowship in the UK, you, they usually have 400 um, applicants and only 40 pass the exam. They are very tough exams. So I cried and I made it a drama. And then my father said, okay, when you are doing the exam again? I said, I'm not doing it again. And this is a lesson that I took, is you don't fail when you fail. You fail when you quit trying. And he said, you have to do it again, and next time you will succeed. So you have to try again. So what we did, me and my friend, because we both failed, it wasn't me alone. So we went back and we studied, and we went for a course workshop where we learned how to do it. And then we um, got a professor to show us, of course, I don't want to discuss you, but again, we used to work on cadaver, and he showed us where everything goes and come and everything. So when we went for the exam, we passed. We, we passed and we were the two first Saudi women to get the fellowship exam over 10 years when people were setting the exam, but nobody would pass. So that was a big pride for the hospital, for our families, for everyone. I mean, our medicine. And I was accepted in oral uh, and, and, and prosthetic dentistry. And I knew, okay, surgery is not for women. That's the message I received. So I paid and I become enrolled. And just like a month later, I got accepted in four universities for oral surgery. <laughs> I was too late and I said, okay, maybe that's the path that God wants for me. So I just went through it. And I moved to London and I studied and then I did my second part fellowship. And again, I didn't fail from, uh, pass from the first time. I had to fail two, two or three times before I got it. But again, every time I start to study more and more and I... I get to become more creative and finding out how can I learn things better and learn it to the standards that they want us to do. So, so tell us something about setting up your business in Dubai. You right. and I was a consultant and then I had to start from zero and zero was bad. Zero was borrowing money from your husband every month because you can't pay you know, salaries or rent because you know, you're not known. That's right. so I had how not did your, you go about establishing the business? I, this is what I did. I went to the States and I, um, and I get myself... Um, training on lasers, dentistry, CAD CAM technology, everything like most advanced and I bought some uh, machines and I, start, I hired a marketing person and we started to look at how we can um, be in the market. And again, I was lucky because there was an, uh, a program, a makeover program for the NBC channel called with Jewel. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So I did the first few episodes in 2006 and 2005, six and seven. And that exposed me into the global community because this is a channel that is seen across the whole globe. And then I started to get people flying to come to see me for dental work. And, and this is when I started to see American and British and French patients. I actually have patients flying from um, Africa, from, from everywhere, because it really gave you that, um, that you know, uh, trust. And they see your work because the makeover program they see somebody before and after, so they can see the change and the difference. But it wasn't easy because, as I said, um, the beginning, I, um, I didn't know how to start this. But at one point, uh, when I started to get very busy, we, we've been looking at expanding the business. And uh, my husband, who, um, told, who's very supportive, um, he told me, hey, but why don't you study management? Because this is what you lack. You, you're very good at your field and your profession, but you... You don't have the overall um, knowledge on management. So I did a course with the University of um, Dubai with uh, Citibank. Um, and I was one of the first batches. They did this course to empower women. And uh, after that, um, I, I, um, I started child early prevention. Perfect. 
So, in 2008, you co-founded the Child Early Intervention Medical Center, which is the autism speciality center that provides integrated services. Now, what was the impetus for this center? The beginning was in 2007. My daughter was one and one year, three months, and I didn't. I called her. She doesn't answer, and I thought that she doesn't hear. So I took her for a checkup, and they said, "You have to do a proper assessment. She might have autism." Now, at that time, I had no clue what's autism. I, I, first time I hear about it, but I'm a positive person. I look always for solutions. I said, "Okay, let's see what we can do." So we went around, and, and unfortunately, at that time, there were no services. No diagnostic doctors, no psychologists, no appointments for speech, waiting lists, hundreds of children on the waiting list for every service. And there are no schools, no nurseries. Most of the um, centers, non for profit, they will take children after the age of three. She was one and a half years old. And I felt devastated. There was nothing. And I had sat with my husband and we discussed what can we do? Shall we move to America? Shall we move to Canada? Or do something here? So we decided that, let me do something here, and I decided to stay and, and make a difference. When I, um, shall I talk, or you want to ask me before sure, no, I think I think what, what you might want to uh, emphasize a little bit uh, is how did you create the need within the community? Because if Why? you are setting up a center, that also means that somewhere you want people to get you know, attracted to the kind of service that you're providing. Why well, the, the patients were there. There were waiting lists everywhere. I mean, they were looking for hope, looking for, for something. Um, what, we did, what I did at that time is I had this idea, like everybody in this room, you have this idea. There is something you want to do, but you don't know how. I just finished from the University of Dubai diploma, so I had also this, the skill or the tool to help me to put that idea into a paper as a business plan. But I still felt something was missing because you're not confident enough whether I do it, not do it, how do I do it. I think I was also lucky. I was invited to attend a conference in Jordan under the patronage of Her Highness Queen Rania. And it was sponsored by Vital Voices, whose chairman is Hillary Clinton. And full pay, everything. And so I wanted to meet Queen Rania. She's a beautiful woman, inspiring. Um, I signed for the conference. Believe me, I didn't even know what is the name of the conference. It was collaboration of non for I didn't have a clue what that means. But when I went to the conference, it was such an inspiring... There are some events when you, you attend them, they, um, they affect you deeply and they turn your life upside down. And that was one of the life-changing events that I attended. Because there I have seen women and men who started projects individually that have impacted large... Um, large um, uh, community, community at large. Conference, um, I was asked to present my, my project, and I said, all oh, what I have is a business plan. And they say, it's fine. Bring your business plan. So I put a nice business plan, and I met with a consultant. And I was so inspired, and everybody was pushing me to do it because it's a, a social entrepreneur. People need it. It's something that they could help me with if I needed any support. So once you feel that the community or some people are backing you up and telling you, do it. It's needed. We will be there to support you if you need anything. Um, this is when I made a decision, okay, I know exactly what I need to do. I just have to go and, and do it. You said that you're a social entrepreneur because you are you know, creating value for the society, for the community. There was a gap. You identified the gap. You, you, you had the idea, but from the idea to what is now a very, very visible and uh, you know, a successful space, uh, you might have done a lot of, you know, to, to create that critical mass which was necessary in order to make this change move, move ahead, to provide this integrated service. How did you create, how did you do the stakeholder management, I mean, in order to develop the ecosystem around your social entrepreneurship? At the UNESCO, we brought everybody and we started to brainstorm how can we make inclusion work. How, so every one of us, I mean, we were such a big committee which is, was very difficult to meet on a regular basis. but. After four or five meetings, we stopped, but everybody started to work in his own um, premises. So the KHDA came with the point system for the school's assessment. And today, if you want to become a school that is excellent, you have to have inclusive education. And that made a huge difference because today, I mean, I'm comparing to 2008 when we were begging schools to take a child. The school might accept, but then the thing is the child show progress, show improvement show them that they are wrong. 
So they start to ask, okay, can we have another child? And then we started the barter uh, deal. Like we go to the school and tell them, we will give you free training, but you have to take four kids. And we will train all your staff free of charge. So we started like this. And now we have one school that we have 26 kids from our center in one school. So it becomes now a trend. Now all the schools and nurseries are calling, can you please provide us with training? Can you please give, refer us children? Because everybody now is wanted. But not every school is inclusive. I mean, for inclusion, you need to have a lot of modification of the curriculum. The, the, the teachers themselves have to be engaged in the process, an individual education plan for each child. But we change. And today, it's, it's very interesting. It's, very, it's really um, uh, flattening, to our, to, flattering to our heart to see that we've made a difference. I, we have 70% of our children now in school, and we have over 120 ch children in our uh, center. The 30% who don't go to school are either too young in preparation phase or too old to be accepted. So in 2010, we started the Child Learning and Enrichment Medical Center because we have children who are 6, 7, 8, but they are not in school. We couldn't find them placement. So we wanted to look at creative ways. So we started a school-like classrooms, which equip the child with the learning and the writing and the reading so that they can easily move to KG1 or KG2. So we managed to start to we include about 18 kids from that center. And then this year, I have kids who are 9, 11, and 12. And 9, 11, and 12 is very difficult to go to KG1 or KG2. They are too, too tall to be sitting with very young kids. So we started the K-12 online um, curriculum so that they can study even though they can't be in school. And this is how creativity, and, 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 and we are always following what is needed. These children need to learn. They need a curriculum. They need a place. And if school is not the option, let's give them something that is an option. And just last week, we have three kids from the K-12 accepted in school. So they are moving from our center to school. Because you're giving them what need, they need to succeed into a different environment, but that's what, what they need. And it doesn't come easy, but you have to be creative and bring people into the table and discuss how we can make this happen. Also created a lot of visibility around it by sharing the success awareness stories. Also, yes. and raising awareness. Um, we started um, when when we did the "I Want to Go to School" campaign. It wasn't just like meeting with people. We have started a, a teacher program, teacher development program. So we started with something called "Recovery Begins with Teacher" and then successful inclusion, and then we make it as a conference. And now it's an annual conference. We did it in Oman. We did it in, we're doing it in Saudi. So what we're doing is we're giving them a model of how to be successful in including special children into your classroom. And we give them the tools. Now, a lot of this also need a lot of one-to-one um, -one support, but at least the concept is there and raising their awareness that it is possible. We have a lot of success. And it's good because now we can see that the whole, the whole community have changed. I mean, the vision of Sheikh um, Hamdan bin Mohammed bin Rashid in 2015 is that Dubai become the most uh, inclusive city, an idol or an example of a city that is friendly to disability. And in October 2015, all government entities met in a conference where they have discussed how they can, inside government and um, uh, to cater, inside the government, put solutions and put um, um, things to become more inclusive. So you can see that the move is there, and, and the vision is there, and all what is happening now is a reaction to what we've been working on for a few years. You are the voice of your child. He has no voice. If you don't fight for him, he's going to lose all his rights. And unfortunately, this is one of the challenges that we still have, and we're still working on it. This is one of the areas. The second area is the community. Community don't know much about autism. A lot of April is the awareness month for autism, and there is a lot of heavy media and uh, written media and, and, and brochures given out and lectures and everywhere we can access just to get people to understand that it's okay and it is, it's, it's fine and something that we can, we can manage and try to help you with. So today there, are mo there is more acceptance and we know that because there have been a lot of work on awareness over the last few years. But again, some people still don't know anything about it. And, and the third problem is the acceptance in the schools. So we have to bring this all in a holistic approach where you have the acceptance coming from every level, not only from the teacher who, for her, this is an extra work. It's a lot of extra work for a teacher to have 25 kids and then a special child in her classroom. 
But this is where we come as a professional institute, where we have to help the teacher, help the child, help the parent, train the parents, train the shadow teachers, so that we can bring all this into more harmony, and then people can see the results they want to see. But leadership is also about establishing your credibility that is derived from character, and that, in, in a way, you are your role important model for the because, others. Again, you're talking about sustainability. Now, what in your view? Now, when we look at data, uh, of course, in the entrepreneurial space, more and more women are coming in. There is some literature to show that women sometimes quit corporates because they're not able to climb up and therefore they, they become entrepreneurs. Now, you are a success story when it comes to, you know, working not only uh, in hospitals and then you set up your business and then you set up a social entrepreneurship venture. In your view, what are the factors that limit the success of women? Or if I were to ask the other question, what are the factors that have contributed to your success? A woman as a businesswoman woman, woman as a professional. Women who are working in organizations and um, feel that they are stressed out because no matter what they do, they are not recognized and they are not valued, they tend to quit. Mm -hmm. Because it's all about respect and, 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 and showing that it's not about pay. I mean, a lot of people really don't get, but they still work for that organization because they feel that they are valued. Um, and it's... As an owner or an entrepreneur who's setting a business, you have to look always after your people. These are your assets. Because an organization without people, I mean, unless you are an online organization, most of the time you cannot succeed. The success happens when you start to look at the people. Number one is selection. You select the right people to work with you. Once you have the right people, the right skill, train them and coach them and then let them do the thing and empower them. Empowering people and delegate work to them and coach them is more powerful and more, um, more effective for you to grow. Because if you keep on doing things by your hand, you will never be able to go to the next level. And it will not happen if you keep on doing things and micromanage. It will only happen when you start delegating and coaching and mentoring. And this is the, the, the real talent, is to be able to identify who can do this job. Now, you can't also hire people who are exactly like you, because you will end up doing the same mistakes over and over and over again. You have to have people who balance you, people who have something that you don't have. So let's say you don't pay attention to details, you hire somebody who pays attention to details. You are very much a quick and fast thinker, you have to somebody to slow you down a little bit so that you have the balance. Because everybody is different and their difference brings strong impact to your organization. Um, so what I, I mean, what I look always is when they tell me she can't do this job, I said, let's see what is her strength. How can I use this strength that the person has and keep the job that they are not good at? So you can always get very good results from people if you start to see the cup full and not um, empty, half empty. Uh, Dr. Hiba, as a businesswoman, key success factors, as a mother, as an entrepreneur, how do you manage all of these roles? You jiggle the balls all the time. <laughs> I think there is nothing wrong with prioritizing. So if your child is sick, your child is your priority. If your husband wants you, because he wants your advice or he wants you to be by him because he's in need, you have to give that. And that cannot happen if you micromanage. If you remember, if you do everything by yourself, you cannot balance. You will always give up something on the extent of something else. But when you start to build your team around you and delegate to them, it would be easier for you to trust that they can take care of this um, business or of this project while you are trying to focus on what is priority. And your priority change. There is not no plat plateau. Like today it's your kid, tomorrow it's your business, the next day it's the municipality, the fourth day. Every day you have something different comes up and you have to give it your focus. And it will only happen if you have a good team and you can delegate things to others.